Hey, Jason. Are you muted? I'm not I, muted now. I hear you. Okay, great. Um, and uh, there are a lot of people coming in. And um, got it. Okay. Jason? Yes. Did, did you record the last uh, session? Yes, I did. And, we'll and this be session is going to will be recorded as well. And we'll be able to see it uh, at some point? Uh yeah. It's a large video file, so I spent part of the day uh converting it into a much smaller one that will I can actually post on my website. Um, but it, this meeting has, be, as soon as the meeting's begun, it's started to record. Um, now, why don't, um, how, how's everyone doing? So, so everybody, um, could, could turn off your, your mic or turn on your mic just so we can check and just ha go around. Um, and uh, make sure that everybody's mic is working fine. Um, I don't think you need to keep it off. Um, I think we, we can maintain order. And if you want to um, talk, you can just make a, I can see everybody, so you can make a gesture to me. Um, what I want to do is, um, okay. Great, okay. I need to, um, I haven't done this with so many people, so um, I need to get uh, the web page that I made uh, opened and functioning. Um, I just had like a series of like a cascade of technological problems, like my phone for some reason isn't ringing and uh, the internet connection totally went out. But I think I've remedied everything. Um, so. It's 1815. Can everyone uh, see my um, screen right now? Like my, it, it should be a Zoom page at the moment. Can, can someone let me know if they can see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. just you. We see you. Yeah, I see you, Jason. You don't yeah. see my computer screen. Just your mind. No. Oh. Nice shirt. Like your shirt. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, Give me one second. Where's everybody at? I'm um, I'm in Colorado, and it's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. So, can you uh, see it now? No. Let's no. see what, why it's not working. You, you had it at yesterday's meeting. Well, I did this. I've just done the same thing that I did then. 
and um, it should it's what I'm gonna do is um, appoint someone. Uh, actually, I don't know how to do that yet. Um, can we just bring up your website? Yeah, why don't you do do that? I have it up ready to go. I'm looking okay, at it. Okay, if everyone can bring up the website, we should be in good shape. But I'm, um, I can also bring it up. Uh, let's see. There, there's some, there you go. Now you're doing something, Jason. Yeah, it says. Yeah. Oh, looking at your phone. Yeah, we're looking at my phone. And um, we should be able to get to the, the site. Uh, Um, see if that works. It's all sorts of dashes. Craig dash Santos dash Perez dash three dash two two. Okay. There it is. Right. Yeah. This is it. All right. So, so, we, we, so everyone can see the, the phone now, is that right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. You can't see the phone. We can. Yeah. Okay, great. You have 36% of your battery. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's plugged into my computer, which is plugged into power, so we should be okay. But the only way I could uh, get onto the internet was to turn my phone into a hotspot, so I'm on the internet through my phone. Um, but what I wanted to do is, Craig is going to uh, call in at about 6.45, um, and... Um, what I thought we should do is just take, uh, I mean, how, how does everyone feel in, um, in terms of how they are, uh, how much preparation they were able to do so far? Uh, we, I've listened to the um, oceans, the praise for the oceans. Okay, that... great. So what I'd like to do is um, scroll through the images that I've put up on the website and have us read his introduction to uh, the poetry of the Pacific. Yeah, I've read that too. Okay. Um, and then we're, I, I want to talk about um, his poem about his daughter. Um, and basically really turn it over to you guys to ask him questions um, because last night and the previous meeting, I talked for 80% of the time and um, 
I'd really like you guys to have the chance to uh, be able to um, talk talk with him. And we'll, uh, so, so what I put together was the ocean, which we'll come back to. Um, and was every, raise your hand if, if you did not get a chance to read this introduction. Okay, I think it's it's really important that we we all are on the same page with it. But what I want to do is go past the text to where I put up a bunch of pictures um, about the Pacific. Um, so this is going through text of the ocean poem. This is another poem. This is a poem he sent to me. And this is another poem I'm really interested in. Um, but I went through and tried to make a kind of uh, visual essay about the Pacific. Um, so, let's see. Um, so we can see we've read um, two Hawaiian poets, one poem from Guam, and uh, Dan Talapuapa uh, McMullen, who's from American Samoa. So we can kind of see how distant as possible they could be from each other. Um, so this map is just to give us a basic sense of the geography. The next map is to show the roots, the initial roots of exploration. So here's uh, Byron, uh, Captain Byron and Captain Cook's uh, meanderings around in which um, Cook managed to get to um, uh, Hawaii and to Samoa and an explorer named Byron managed to get to um, Guam. And then, so this is kind of the early the earliest map I could find that's kind of um, indicating spheres of colonial influence already um, over the different areas. I'm sorry I can't blow it up to a screen, a giant screen size for you. Um, so then we have the American Empire in 1903, which is after the uh, Spanish-American War, when um, the US won possession of the Philippines and Guam, and uh, had also basically taken over and forced out the Queen of Hawaii. So at this point in 1903, the U.S. has pretty much um, cornered all of these different islands. Um, and I thought it was useful to, to remember this Rudyard Kipling poem um, in terms of the British called to the U.S. to take care of the Pacific. Um, could somebody just read that aloud? Can you see it well enough to read it? 
Nicholas, can you see it well enough to read it? Um, I don't see it. Is that, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, is that, I, on, I didn't see a link to your website on the email. So I, I guess I'm supposed you to be didn't, I, I sent it out. Uh, if you go back and check. Um, I just sent it to the chat box, Nicholas, if you want to check there. Okay, great. Because uh, it says, I mean, I've got an email. It says, here's the web page I built for us tonight. And then I don't see a link to it. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you click on the, uh, the chat box, Jason has just posted a link to the website. On the chat box. So in the bottom. Iris? Yeah, bottom of your of your Zoom screen there, Nicholas. Okay. The bottom of the Zoom, or you mean on the right where it says double click on the Zoom package icon or something? If Let's you, see. Did you do the chicken? If you go. Um, I click on that. There should be a, a did that I first to indicate to, to enter the chat. So let's see. Okay. Uh, you see um, participants and um, invite, mute, video. See all those icons there, Nicholas? The icons, uh, it says there's one th box on the right that says click icon above. I don't know, I could click on that and see what well, it does. Well, click on that icon quick. Okay. It's not doing anything. Mm. What what device are you using? You're using a PC or an iPad or? Uh, I'm using a Mac. Try a mouse down on the bottom and see if a, a, a black bar comes up that says mute, stop video, invite, participants, share screen, chat. Yeah. Right. There should be a little bar that yeah, has the meeting ID um, and in it, and if you put your cursor there, um, a little screen will come down, and you should be able to uh, navigate around through that. You, um, you didn't watch the instructional video that I sent. <laughs> Uh, on Zoom? Yes. Uh, I don't think I saw that. Let's see. It's a, it's a bar across the bottom, Denny, that it, it's, it's got a uh, leave meeting is in the far right and it's in red. Do you see that? Uh, uh, I, I don't have that on my screen at all. What do you have on your screen? Well, I've got, I can see Terry and uh, Jason and Christy in, this, in these little tiny boxes on the right. <laughs> okay, so, so move your cursor to the center of the screen. Uh, yeah. And either directly above that or directly below that should be a little unusual bar. Well, there's a thing in the middle of the screen. It says, I mean, you, it's already downloaded. It says the download should automatically start. If not download here, I guess I could click on that and see what happens. I mean, maybe I don't oh, have a thing it, on there. Like, don't click on that. <laughs> don't click on that. No. Okay. Um, I just, Denny, I just sent it to you in an email, the link if you want. Uh, okay, well, I've got it. I, I should get it on my phone then. I mean, uh, let's see. Uh, you just sent that to me, Terry? Okay, I just got something from Terry. Okay, so if I click on this, then I'm going to get this on my phone. I've got two devices here. Okay. All right, so... Um, um, but somebody else can read this too, it's, can see it. Well, it's, this is something from, uh, I think I've seen s at least some of this. I mean, I saw, I, I looked at Praise Song for the Ocean this morning. 
and then I've read this new Pacific Islander poetry. I guess that's the introduction. I read that, but then right, that's that's um, all I wanted to make sure that you. Oh, have. okay, but I I don't see anything yeah. by Rudyard Kipling and all that. Um, you need to scroll past all the text all the way down. Okay, okay, I'm scrolling down. Uh, okay. Um, uh, be, be below the maps and stuff. Oh, yeah, the maps oh, are the oh, the okay, maps so, are the. Oh, okay, so it's the it's the white man's burden. <laughs> right, right. So is it the one? Uh, uh, oh, it looks like it's it's printed twice. Is it the white man's no, burden? No, it's it's simply time. divided in half. Oh, okay. So it's so so. So from the start, okay, so it's by Rudyard Kipling, an appeal to the United States to assume the task of developing the Philippines, recently won in the Spanish-American War. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives' need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples half devil and half child. Take up the white man's burden, impatient to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride by open speech and simple, an hundred times mad plain, to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Right, so we're not exactly set up for a positive outcome. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> um, Jason, uh, that was on the back of the soap, hair soap that's there, that was printed on the back of it? Um, it was? I think I, so. I yes. believe so, yes. It looks somewhere. Huh. Um, it looks... Yeah. I mean... Um, you know, I mean, I know, I know, like Kipling was was a great imperialist, uh, right? But I mean, if I just like read this, I mean, I guess maybe it's because it's because of where we are in the twenty first century. Then I mean, I I totally think that this guy was being completely ironic. <laughs> well, um, I don't think he was. I don't think. No, he no, was. I don't think so either. But but that's because. I know the context, you know, I mean, if I didn't, if I, I mean, if I'd never heard of Rudyard Kipling and I, I thought he was some guy who wrote this in the last two years or something. Well, hopefully that that's not, um, hopefully that context is clear. Yeah. Um, I mean, what we really are want to look at is just the general situation of the Pacific Ocean the kind of 20th century narrative of events, which begin with that poem in a sense, and the, this, this headline from the, the world, Dewey smashes Spain's fleet. Um, and so um, we could, I, I could also have included Filipino American um, poets in the class, but um, their situation is different. I mean, what happens in the Pacific is there is um, a great, there, there is huge economic interest at play due to the whaling industry um, and on some of the larger tropical islands, there are huge in, uh, economic interests in the plantations, um, which, and so poor uh, people from elsewhere in the Pacific are converging on these plantations to, uh, believing that they'll have a, a different, better life, that the Ameri that the, that they kind of believe the, the ideology of the white man's burden or kind of talked into it. 
Um, but so after that, of course, we have um, World War Two. I mean, World War One is not as dramatically fought in the Pacific as World War Two and its aftermath. So this is a map of um, the kind of you can see here's the sphere of influence and you can see an arrow going directly to Guam and then directly uh, through Manila to Hong Kong. Um, and so, and, and also an arrow to Samoa. So uh, Guam and Samoa became crucial military bases in World War II. Um, and the military presence, but these weren't islands that necessarily like Hawaii had a huge uh, culture of, um, of in kind of plantation barons who were uh, the wealthy European Americans. Um, who were, you know, basically running slave labor on the plantations from a mix of people from, from all over the, especially Japan and, and China. Um, here's a, a Japanese map of the, the war. Um, Here's the kind of final map of the war. Um, but we have, um, so there's a battle in Guam. Guadalcanal is right near American Samoa and we have Pearl Harbor. Um, these, I mean, this is a war that is not being fought among the people who live on these islands. This is a war that is being, you know, they're being essentially invaded in order to become military installations. Um, but then after the war, we know what happened in the Pacific was the beginning of US nuclear bomb testing. Um, which also left a huge legacy on the peoples of the islands and especially, of, of course, the islands that were destroyed, but um, we also have the memory of the threat of the U.S. could come here and do a, a nuclear bomb test. Um, so we have, uh, this is the Pacific nuclear test sites. Um, which are, you know, spread out all over the entire Pacific. So here's, here's a little bomb. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to go through this quickly because Craig's going to be joining us soon. So there was also uh, a huge movement on these, there began to be a, a, pol a kind of political consciousness of not only a resi at the same, what happened with the U.S claiming these islands as U.S. territories because of their military significance um, caused a whole cascade of events. On one side, the compulsory public education of the non-English speaking uh, native uh, population 
and the descendants of those who uh, arrived to work on the plantations. But the bombs begin to also crystallize a sense of um, as if the war will never end and that the disregard for the life of the people and the life of these islands is is essentially absolute. You know so, what that was? I mean, Craig's poetry is often very angry. Sees, I mean, so this is Guam, a shot of Guam now. Great. Um, wow. So, I mean, Guam basically became, it, it's not a, a huge island, but its children were forced to learn English and to, in the same way that the American Indians were to uh, lose their language in favor of adopting an Eng English. But you can kind of imagine what's going on in these schools as these children are growing up in the 50s and the 60s as um, it would be like taking French class at an American high school. It's not like everyone then is going to speak French in the hallways. So at home and outside of the immediate classroom, the other languages um, are both being suppressed, feeling like the attempt to suppress them because the Americans uh, act with great prejudice against those who don't speak English well. Um, and kind of gives rise to a sense of an identity that um, is in a kind of essential, almost linguistic conflict with the Americans. Um, and as well in the Pacific, we have natural disasters. Um, hold on, getting people trying to Someone calling from Honolulu. It's Craig. Hey, Craig, can you hear me? It's eighteen forty five. Oh, hold on. I need to stop sharing this uh, screen for a second. Um, Craig, can you hear me? You know, uh, anybody that lives in the... Uh, Craig, can you hear me? Okay, great. So, yeah, you can... We had some technical difficulties but um, we're, we're all here. Um, so if you want, um, I can admit you into the, into the room. So uh, if you go to that link, it'll... Uh, I, you should, can unplug now. I should see you... Um, Uh, kind of standing at the doorway. Yes. Yeah. No, it's 
coach, dice. No, ¿dónde está? está ahí. This is great. It is good to see other people, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I should. Uh... You can unplug now. I, I see a, um, is your number 202? Oh, it has been cut. Okay. Um, I am not, um, let's see if I can find another place to look. Let you in. Um, do you want to? Why don't Why don't you log out and and try to log back in? Here we go. I see it now. There you are. Okay. Hello. So what what we've been doing is uh, I, I've just been kind of uh, talking about the kind of recapitulating your your intro essay. Um, kind of by scrolling through the the pictures that I put up on the website. Um, and a lot of people have seen the video, um, but it might be a good idea to maybe we, um, since we have the text of it now in front of us, um, so on the website, everybody, and in the PDF that I sent earlier, um, the text of the, the video poem is there. So you should be able to oh. follow along with it um, as, we, as we watch. And then, um, Craig, you could maybe talk a little bit about how this came to be made and we can dive in to discussion. Um, so I need to get over here. Okay. Um, you, I, we can get off the phone. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, hey, can you still hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so we got through uh, some of this. Um, and I kind of thought that I, I tried to kind of find pictures that kind of echoed the themes in that poem. So I might, uh, I'm gonna go back up to the video and we can watch it all. Can everyone uh, see the video screen now? Denny, can you see it? 
What, whose video screen, uh, yours? Mine, yes. Uh, no, I just see you. No, stop again. Huh? You don't see everyone? Uh, I just see four people. I, I mean, I have to scroll up and down. I just have like a little thumbnail of four people on the side. I can't seem to get a big picture of everybody, but. Okay, well, after, after the meeting, we're gonna have a little training session. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that, that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna figure out what's, what's, what's gonna miss. So that, because we're, I wanna do, uh, hold several more discussions. Um, this is new technology to me as well. And I've done my best to try to get up to speed on it, but it's, um, it's new and it's, it's uh, not necessarily intuitive. Um, but you should be able to hear at least. Uh, yeah, I can hear fine. Uh, you seem to be able to hear me fine, so yeah, that part's working. Praise song for Ocean. Praise your capacity for birth, your fluid currents and trenchant darkness. Praise your contracting waves and dilating horizons. Praise our briny beginning, the source of every breath. Praise your capacity for renewal, your rise into clouds and descent into rain. Praise your underground aquifers, rivers and lakes, glaciers and watersheds. Praise your capacity to endure the violence of those who claim dominion over you, who map you empty ocean to pillage, who divide you into latitudes and longitudes, who scar your middle passages. Praise your capacity to survive our trawling boats taken from your collapsing depths. Praise your capacity to dilute our sewage and radioactive waste, pollutants and plastics, heavy metals and greenhouse gases. Praise your capacity to bury soldiers, terrorists, slaves, refugees, to bury the ashes of our loved ones. Praise your capacity to remember Praise your library of drowned stories and museum of lost treasures. Praise our migrant routes and submarine routes. Praise your capacity to cleanse rising tides, relentless storms, towering tsunamis and feverish floods. Praise your capacity to smother schools of fish, to save them from our cruelty to show us what we're no longer allowed to take, to starve us like your corals are being starved and bleached, liquid lungs choked of oxygen. Praise your capacity to forgive. Please forgive our territorial hands and acidic breath. Please forgive our nuclear arms and naval bodies. Please forgive our concrete dams and cabling veins. Please forgive our deafening sonar and lustful tourisms. Please forgive our invasive drilling and deep sea mining. Praise your capacity for mercy. Please let our grandfathers and fathers catch just one more fish. Please make it stop raining soon. Please make it rain soon. Please spare our fragile farms and fruit trees. Please spare our low-lying islands and atolls. Please spare our coastal villages and cities. Please let us cross safely to a land without war. Praise your capacity for hope. Praise your rainbow warrior and peace boat, Hokulea and sea shepherd, Arctic sunrise and flotillas of hope. Praise your marine stewardship councils and sustainable fisheries. Praise your radical seafarers and native navigators, your activist kayaks and canoes. Praise your sacred water walkers. Praise your ocean conservancies and surf rider foundations. Praise your aquanauts and hydrolabs 
tribes praise your well hunting and shark finning bands praise your sanctuaries and no take zones praise your pharmacopoeia of new antibiotics praise your wave and tidal energy praise your hashtag ocean optimism and hashtag hope spots praise your capacity for echo location Tasi and Kai and Tai and Moana Nui and Vasa and Tahi and Vaitui and Wanso Wara, all our names for you translate into creation stories and song maps. Praise your capacity for communion. Praise our pathway and promise to each other. Praise our common heritage, our endless saga, our most powerful metaphor. Praise your vision of belonging. Praise your horizon of care. Praise our blue planet, one world ocean. Praise our transoceanic past, present, and future flowing through our blood. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to move down to the text of the, the poem. Um, does anyone, um, I have lots of questions for Craig, but I'd rather if we start off with someone else's, uh, thoughts. So feel free to just speak up. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to know if there's a traditional, if this comes from some kind of traditional format, uh, you know, is it based, is it built on something that <laughs> is from the tradition that you grew up in? Uh, I kind of base it on two things. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, one is uh, thinking about praise songs. Uh, you know, I grew up, Guam is a very Catholic island. So I was thinking about, uh, you know, church songs, praise songs. And then also I was, uh, you know, Pacific cultures chant is very important. So I wanted it to, to also have a chant-like structure to the poem. And so there's a lot of, uh, of course, repetition and so I was trying to bring those two things together, um, you know, both the kind of church praise song, but also a Pacific chant. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily based on one particular chant, but just trying to bring those two ideas together. Uh, and then, of course, to praise the ocean, which is such an important uh, symbol in our culture. Well, would, I mean, would you say it goes beyond being a symbol to be um, something that is. Uh, it's 19 hours. That is, that is a kind of cre creating spirit. I mean, that is, that is the, the, the source of life. I mean, that, that's the ocean that is sacred not in the sense of like a Catholic relic, but sacred in the sense of its absolute um, centrality to the like the the kind of uh, ways of being. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I wanted to, you know, be beyond it being just a symbol of different, of different things, you know, wanted to capture it, its materiality as well, like as, as a space, you know, where we go fishing or, uh, you know, a place of recreation where we swim, place where we do sports, uh, but also think about it as an economic space, um, a space of travel and mobility. And then of course, a, a, a place that is under threat uh, by different kinds of, of industries 
um, a space of change, especially you know now in, in this time of, of climate change and ocean acidification and things like that. And then of course also as, as a metaphor for hope or for the thing that connects all of us, uh, you know, metaphor for like fluidity and flow and movement. So this poem tries to weave together all the different meanings and symbolisms and materialities uh, of the ocean that at least I could bring together in this one poem. Right. Yeah. I have a, a question. You, you use uh, the hour, O-U-R. Uh, your seems to be the earth or spirits or something, but the hour, you, you seem to include uh, a lot of the terrible things that, that you might say others are doing. So in a sense, you seem to be saying you're part of that and maybe not taking ownership, but you're part of it. We, we kind of uh, talked about that during some of the, I think it was the Leslie Marmon uh, Silco poetry, where she's not blame, you know, she's saying, uh, we invented the white man, you know, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not the victims here. And uh, is, so what's that about? Yeah, great, great point. I, you know, that's I, I kind of was thinking about, uh, you know, the your and the our and kind of the space between, um, you know, those peoples and constituencies and thinking about how we're all kind of implicated and interconnected in those ways. Um, you know, of course, you know, some people or companies or, or nations are, are more responsible than others or more implicated. But I also want to think about how we're all, um, you know, have kind of a, like a footprint in a way in, in impacting the ocean and, and at the same time that the ocean impacts us mm -hmm. as well. And the more we change the ocean, and of course I use that we, you know, again, in, in a very broad sense, um, thinking about how we define that we and, um, you know, of course, a big issue is plastic, and you know we're, we all kind of use plastic, and so think about how that, you know, connects us in these interesting entangled ways when thinking about about the ocean and about water and, and flow and, and connectivity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right. Well, it's it's interesting to think about because um, I I put a bunch of pictures of. Uh, ocean plastic. Um, there's a picture of a, a whale washed up on a beach full of plastic. And um, the, the <clears throat> one, one, uh, um, image that recurs in your poetry is um, spam. Hmm. It doesn't occur in this poem, but it, it cer there's certainly a lot of spam poems, not the email spam, but the, can the tinned meat. And I was wondering if you could talk about the fact of, I mean, in a way, um, the kind of uh, global traveling um, and, and the way, you know, the Pacific being used as a route for trade um, rather than the islands being used and the ocean being used as sources of their own sustenance. Um, why? It's as if spam signals the beginning of packaged, the, the pa of packaging. Um, spam was uh, 
something that was preserved and lasts. I mean, spam is is a kind of, to me, a, co a cousin of plastic, just in terms of its um, infinite shelf life and its um, its containment. I mean, the source of uh, in the Pacific Islands, what a container would have been before colonialism and certainly before the 20th century would be an organic thing that, that wasn't, do you see what I'm kind of getting at? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great connection. Um, for those who aren't familiar, I do, I have a lot of poems about spam and about food in the Pacific in general. And, you know, I do try to highlight the, the kind of the processed and colonial quality of, of canned meats because these foods are very prevalent here in the Pacific. And, you know, as you said, they are, you know, processed foods, uh, commodity foods, and of course they are canned, so they last a very long time. Not quite as long as plastic, but the same kind of idea. Um, unfortunately, both plastic and these canned foods have caused a lot of both environmental damage in, in terms of plastic, but also, uh, you know, human damage as well in the sense that a lot of places in the Pacific, a lot of our peoples have very high rates of uh, obesity and diabetes, heart disease, basically other kinds of illnesses related to a poor diet or a diet reliant on processed foods. And so this is, um, you know, both spam and plastic came to the Pacific, you know, through, uh, you know, colonialism and imperialism, as you mentioned. And you know, these kinds of impositions are, are things that we are struggling with. And so in my own poetry, I tried to highlight, um, you know, those kind of deeper dynamics uh, to think about plastic and, and spam, not just as everyday food items or everyday items of use, but also their deeper meanings. And I think to me, uh, that's the power, power of poetry to be able to get at, at those deeper meanings and significations. Right. I see that in the chat box, Lowell has a, um, Lowell has a question. Um, would you, you like me to, would you like me to read it out loud? Yeah. Okay, this is from Lowell. In addition to the chant quality, it seems there is in the reading a sense of the overwhelming cascading sound. Is that intentional? And if so, what does it evoke? Uh, thank, thank you, Lowell. Um, should I type the answer as well as uh, say it? It's up to you. Up to me? Okay. Um, yeah, I love that idea of the poem having a, a overwhelming cascading sound. Uh, I'm not sure if it was, maybe it was more intuitive. I think I was, when I was writing it, I wasn't thinking about that in particular, but when reading the poem aloud, it definitely, I agree, it has that kind of cascade. And, you know, I definitely wanted the poem to have more like a watery rhythm. Okay. I uh, wanted it to have a watery rhythm um, of the tides kind of moving in and out. And I think there are moments in the poem where it does, um, you know, become more, more like a tsunami perhaps or, or larger rising wave and, and crashing and a breaking to it. And so, you know, in some ways, I don't know, you know, if, if all of you are writers, you know, sometimes you're writing and it's more based on instinct and intuition, not necessarily on intention and, and rationality. Um, but I, I love that interpretation of, of creating a, a chant-like cascading sound to it that has different kind of, of rhythms throughout the poem. So was it was it also then a conscious decision to um, 
or or maybe not a conscious decision that then in the performing of the poem to um um you know uh sort of like more loosely uh adhere to the um written transcription um i mean it, it follows it pretty closely but not you know not a hundred percent i mean it's it almost sounds like you were you know i mean like you were improving on your poem like you knew it uh uh of course you wrote it so you you knew it but maybe not sort of literally by heart is that did, did uh anyways i i just noticed you know when when uh that when i when we saw the the video and and i was reading the transcription that it, it's it kind of you know some it's anyways it's not it's not it doesn't match you know 100 percent. so i was wondering if that was just um intentional or Jeez, what happened to me? Let's see. Are you still there, Craig? Oh, his I mic. See, I don't see Craig anymore. Craig, Craig's, Craig's here. His microphone is off. I thought it was me. <laughs> no, I'm gonna unmute him and ask him if, if it's okay that I do. Yeah, he's he might be typing a response. Uh huh. Can I be heard? Yes. Okay, great. Like, because I, I, I have you guys in this little picture up in the corner of my screen. Yeah. So, well, what do you, what do you, um, we can discuss, um, we can continue to discuss our own our own responses, and um, I, one thing I wonder is um, I think Craig just got bumped off, so he's probably he'll be back in a moment. Um, what what do we think about? Um, the, I mean, this is an unusual object that's different from most of what we look at um, in that it was specifically designed as a, as a textual visual object. So I wonder, um, well, I mean, Craig is back, but still muted. Yes. So, so Craig has um, has young ones, so uh, mm -hmm. anything could be happening. It's not right. fifteen. Um, but what what else um, do we? So Jason Larry asked a question here in the chat box too, and he asked. Basically, he's asking Craig. Um, it, how much of a spirituality enters your writing? And uh, I thought it was great when he said uh, he, that's a really Catholic island. It, all of a sudden, it just like, oh, you know, grade school, Catholic, Catholic, Catholic grade school just came rushing back in my head, that whole kind of sound of my past, which is really interesting. I'm glad he mentioned that. And so when he comes back, we can ask Larry's question about how much spirituality is enters into this. But did any of you guys, did you hear that as well? Yeah, I, I was totally picking up on that when Once he mentioned Catholic, it was like, boom. Yeah, and, and I was, um, I don't know if you can hear me, this is Lowell. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if, um, if also in that uh, Catholic chant uh, kind of mode, whether Part of his thinking was that um, 
in the writing and then in the saying, whether he believed that, uh, and then the visualization also, whether he believed that creates something that has a force of its own um, uh, out out in the out in the world that actually changes something because uh, of the performance. Okay. See, there's there's a little uh, red microphone. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, but I mean, we need to think also about the. <clears throat> The, the role of the missionaries, I mean, the missionaries really are the first people to make contact with a lot of these populations. And um, I think that the displacement or the integration of the pre-Catholic spirituality and the post-Catholic, I mean, that the Catholicism um, to me doesn't really feel very sacred. It feels like the first harbinger of doom. Well, yeah, sure. And, and also for us as, you know, modern people that grew up with a religion like that it wasn't an empowering religion and i think lowell was asking did he as we've seen with these other poets um think that does he have the feeling you know maybe from his heritage that in saying a poem you create something that's what's really been powerful to me about reading this poetry where you know me saying hail mary full of grace from the world i don't know that i'm going to create anything uh -huh. anything it's more of a penance, you know, it's a, a lash, you know, instead right. of by saying this, I will create a better world. And from the poetry that we've been reading, I think people think that they're saying it, they're speaking it, is going to create something better. It's going to make the magic. Right. Yes. It's, I mean, I mean, in a way, I don't know. I'm raised Catholic and skeptical of Catholicism's uh, role in the world enough to see the Bible uh, arriving on the island as the first can of spam. Does um, so anybody, uh, you know, I always think about these things, even though they're sort of absurd, but, you know, um, Spam, um, you know, it spells maps backwards. Sure. And the thing <laughs> is, why were these people eating it? I mean, in a way, um, it was useful for the, I, it, it was a food that would be distributed by the military for, uh, consumption on long voyages um, but then the people who lived there developed a taste for it and preferred the taste of the spam over the taste of the fish that they could catch you know off the beach you know that's the the uh what we don't know is more interesting to us than what we have available to that, you know, that's every day. Right. Uh, I, I had a friend who was the a Peace Corps director in um, Kiribati, Kiribati, and um, the, you know, so he was kind of an important person on the island. And when they came to bring him a gift, they brought him spam. And he would have much preferred some fresh fish, but instead they thought this was a delicacy. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, when, when my sister was in uh, high school, and this is, you know, in, I don't know, the mid 70s, anyways, then, um, you know, they, they had a spam club, which was just sort of a joke, but it, it was the spam club. She was a member of the spam club. Right. 
Well, I mean, and I guess what I mean is, is when you're uh, on one of these islands, you are in a, a density of, I mean, to think of uh, like a, an inner city urban food desert mm -hmm. where someone might eat spam, you're in the mm -hmm. exact opposite location. You're in a food paradise. Um, but, the, but islands do have limited food production, and 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 bringing something like that in is is a way of controlling the capacity of the population, and and, and so it definitely is, definitely is about control. I think for for sure, and also it costs money. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it institutes an economic. Uh, it starts to extract money from the population. And make them dependent on money instead of dependent on their surroundings. Right. Exactly. Um, Christy, you're from a, um, an island, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm from an island. Yeah. Yeah. Which so, island are you from? I'm from, come from Yale. In Shetland, um, and um, we had spam too. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and and we had a, you know we have a with a different colonial past, not as not as severe, nothing like as severe, but but but, but people, people, uh, people used us. The Danes and then the Scots and then the wow. English, uh, the UK, whatever, whatever. Was, was there a language um, spoken there before? Uh, I mean, was it originally Gaelic? No, no. The 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 the, the there's there's some the the uh, the the. There's evidence of a language that people call Norn, which existed uh, mm. before the Scots arrived, mm. um, which was kind of similar to Old Norse, um, kind of similar to Faroese, um, and uh, and but before before that, um, it's all pretty speculative, really, nice. as to how they communicated. Uh, what was the name of the island again? Uh, Shetland. Shetland. Oh, Shetland. Shetland. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yell in specifically. Specifically Yell. Y E L L as in. Oh. Well, I mean, something, a, a big sweeping point that I want to make is about the history of English itself. Yeah. Which for until Britain became an empire, it was a language that was constantly in flux with uh, contact with uh, uh, people from elsewhere and waves of invasion. And so, I mean, English is a language that is almost like a Creole itself. Yeah. Absolutely. A combination of many, many languages. Um, and it wasn't until Britain uh, became an ep economic powerhouse that English became conventionalized and stopped mm. as a, as a um, as a form of demonstrating order and control, uh, which was something that wasn't, had not been the case. I, I mean, arguably until Johnson, I mean, really, and, 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 and they kind of codified this very local dialect of this very privileged, right? Uh, you know, 
community in the south of England, and that became everybody's English and everybody else's English. It, it is it's, it's still considered improper. Um, right. It became a tool of control and of um, rather something that uh, was fluid and allowing new words in into something that became static and um, a, 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 a weapon almost. Mm. Um, but what happened at the, that time that you're speaking of specifically is the reason England became a mega power is by sheer coincidence mainland Europe had become so deforested because of the Little Ice Age that there was no wood for heat and people were freezing to death. And so it just so happened that England ha was the only place that had a massive supply of coal on the edge of the water uh, near the surface of the earth and was able to, ex because no one used coal, it was gross and nasty um, until uh, the, the deforestation of mainland Europe. Um, and that's how uh, England began to accrue um, its economic uh, force. Mm -hmm. Which brings us again to a strange relationship between the fluctuations between the relationships to the land and the relation and how that's reflected in language. Yeah. And it's the is does does the land include the sea? Uh, uh, as a yeah. Well, and it, I mean, it, it, I mean, definitely, it, it would include the sea. Um, I mean, we have big uh, Nanook Akpix poetry mm. of, you know, kayaking through the slush. This mm. year, a narwhal uh, for you know, to feed her for the next year. Yeah. Well, even the, t the term Oceania, you know, that, that puts a, a different view of, you know, what we call the oceans, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Somehow o Oceania uh, just makes it so much more of a presence than, uh, than, than we have in our daily life. I wonder, Craig, uh, uh, is there something to that, uh, a view of the oceans as Oceania? Yes, definitely. That's a great point. Um, yeah, a couple, there are a couple of Pacific theorists who were, you know, thinking about the idea that, you know, the name Pacific Islands, you know, which are, of course, uh, colonially imposed, kind of cr create a representation of the Pacific as as very distant and small island spaces very isolated and insular mm. so they actually do propose that uh we use the term oceania because it refers mo more to the vast ocean oceanic space and to think of ourselves not not simply as you know islanders on these tiny islands you know spread on the pacific but instead as oceanians who are connected through this vast ocean and even um, there are some uh, Pacific states that consider themselves not small island nations, but large oceanic countries, because uh, you know they see we see ourselves not only as little islands, but as these vast swaths of of kind of oceanic spaces, archipelagic spaces. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see the word Oceania a lot in in Pacific poetry for that very reason to kind of reclaim our connection to the ocean 
and our histories of, of navigation and mobility across ocean spaces. Mm. Wow. I, I wanted to um, introduce a different um, question about um, this poem in relationship to some of the other poems that we looked at of yours today. And there was, um, because we uh, discussed, uh, we've, a lot of the poems we've talked about in the class include um, non-English words. And I was curious about um, the decision in this particular, at the very end, I think that you switched out of English. Um, but in a way that this, I mean, this is a, an amazing uh, art of political art that is accessible to say non-Oceanian um, through the combination of the consistent use of English and merged with the kind of gorgeous imagery populated by the horrifying imagery. And so I wondered also, like, if you thought about this poem as as a kind of different, uh, almost being in a different form than a poem of yours that might involve a lot of uh, Chamorro uh, words. Yeah, that's a great point. Um... You know, for, for the praise song for Oceania poem, I, I wrote that uh, for World Oceans Day. So I wanted the poem, you know, to be more accessible to a global audience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so of course it made sense to write it mostly in English. Although there, there is a moment towards the end when I use uh, Pacific languages and all those, uh, those words are different ways that we say ocean or sea. Right. In Pacific languages. And so that was, again, kind of a way for me to ground it in, in the Pacific. Right. Um, in, my, in the poems about Hawaii, you know, I'm not from Hawaii, Hawaii and I'm not Hawaiian, uh, but my wife is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, living here in Hawaii now, a lot of Hawaiian words are starting to enter my poems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's partly to, to honor the place that I live now and, uh, you know, kind of learning a little bit of the language, uh, you know, to kind of learn about the history of, of a place through through the language, and then of course to honor that place. Uh, and then some of my other poems about Guam, I, I do interweave uh, English and Chamorro. I mostly write in English because that's what we learned in school. And, you know, as you kind of talked about earlier, uh, English has a very colonial history in other parts of the world, Guam included. And so, you know, we were, we were forced to learn English and to learn how to read and write in English, uh, you know, since I was born, basically. And so, uh, you know, I try to capture that kind of, uh, kind of multilingual reality that I grew up in, in which, you know, many of my relatives speak Chamorro and English. Uh, and, but, you know, most of us can only write in English because we were never learned to talk to how to write in our own indigenous language. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of my poems kind of captured that, uh, you know, just that colonial language situation of which, you know, I'm a product of. And, and was the, the language uh, a written language? It is, there, there has developed a written language, you know, it's, it's naturally oral, but uh, orthography has been developed. And, but uh, only a few people living today can write it and they're really like 
Chamorro language scholars and they're, they're linguists as well. Um, I don't have that training, but there are like, for example, professors at the University of Guam who write literature in written Chamorro. Um, I cannot read it. I would have to like sound it out. I would need a lot of help because <laughs> it's very, you know, more scholarly uh, training to do that. Uh, but there is a a language revitalization effort to kind of, you know, to reteach our indigenous language, both orally and written. So uh, hopefully the future generations will be more, more fluent than, than I am. Yes, hopefully for all of us. Um, when you were growing up in, in school, you were being taught English, but outside of school, say, among family one and among peers two, what language languages were you moving around in? So for me, uh, at school, it was it was entirely in English instruction. Um, at home, my father uh, he's a fluent Chamorro speaker, but my mom is not. My mom is also Chamorro, but she only knows English. And so, in my house, uh, usually we would speak English, unless my other relatives came like my grandparents or my aunties and uncles. And then my dad would speak Chamorro with them. And then they would kind of translate with us uh, sometimes or with my mom sometimes. And sometimes they don't translate. And then with my friends, uh, we mostly spoke English as well. Um, I think partly because on Guam, you know, all the media, like pop music, we mostly listen to American music and they show American TVs and American movies. And so that's kind of the, the language of, of popular culture. So that's mostly what we spoke, right. uh, what I spoke with my peers. And, you know, besides that, Guam is, is also very multicultural at this point. Right. It's, you know, a lot of my friends were not Chamorro, maybe they were, they were American or they were Asian or they were other kinds of Pacific Islanders. So we would speak English because that would be the language that we all shared together right. so mostly at home it was you know somewhat bilingual sometimes and then outside the home uh, almost always English one thing uh, that I'm I'm really curious about is that when, when you um, use non-English words in your poem, how um, conscious are you of the effect of those words on different types of readers? Because it seems both like an act of political resistance um, and it also seems like an act of uh, honor, honoring one's ancestors. Um, so I really, we've talked a lot and discussed a lot about the, the poetics of, of, of a multilingual poem and to what degree like you would it would be um like if, you're, if you were doing a reading in guam there would be people who would understand the words all the words in the poem whereas there are uh you know, your u.s monolingual readers are you know who come across those words and might feel like it's not addressed to that like suddenly the poem isn't addressed to them anymore Jason I think we lost him 
Oh, we did? Yeah, just to let you know. Okay. But it's a great question. What do you guys think about that? Th that's been on my mind completely, um, especially comparing the Oceana video poem that we watched. The words are kind of at the end, and it's just like, here are words for ocean, and it, it kind of lays it out for us. But the, um, the other poems have words all intermixed, and it, and it does a, it, it t doesn't take you out of the poem, obviously, but for us non-Hawaiians or Guam people, it does, it makes you, it makes you work, or it, it's a little bit jarring in the sense, and maybe that's part of the purpose. Hi, hi. Um, I'm going to ask about the idea of... Um, I can put you in speakerphone. <laughs> Does somebody know how to mute? In a couple of minutes. Well, one, one thing that we just were, were talking about when you got booted off was um, specifically about how, how you think about the, when you choose to use a non-English word, um, is it even, I mean, to what degree is it a, deli a deliberate poet poetic formal decision? And uh, to what degree are you conscious of the different types of reception <coughs> that different readers would have? Because um, a lot of the students in this class, um, when they've read poems in which they come across a non-English word, actually feel like that they're being kind of kicked out of the poem. Um, or they feel that they are uh, not, not any longer the, the, the audience. And I, I, I can convey what, what you tell me, um, just what, how you think about the impact of the words on, um, say, you know, a speaker from, a monolingual speaker from Indiana. Wait, hold on. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. <laughs> so we should be able to hear you. Oh, wait, hold on. Is okay. your audio plugged into your computer? No, the speed, it should be working now. Go ahead. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 1945. Did you turn it up, Jason? Uh, this is as loud as it will go. Hold it closer to the mic. Um, I don't know where the mic and my computer is. <laughs> um, but I actually downloaded something called like Super Sound Booster. Hold, hold on one second, Craig. I'm gonna see if I can activate that app. Can we talk about hey. Political. While while we're waiting for Jason to get this working, <coughs> so the idea of a, you know, sometimes when you you make a, a political, certainly art, you know, like a, po a poster or something, it becomes then dated. You know, we've thought that about like uh, Anne Waldman and her rogue state kind of stuff. Uh, that it, it seems dated when you address an issue like this. How, how do you guys feel about 
about this idea of trying to, I mean, he really is trying to make a political statement with this poem that the oceans need saving. Or, I mean, do you ignore that? How are you guys feeling about it? I, I don't feel like that's, I mean, I, I normally I kind of agree with you that, that the political uh, poetry can, can quickly become dated. And um, I don't think that's dated because, um, you know, I mean, personally, I mean, my first experience with, you know, ecology came from, you know, uh, Jacques Cousteau, you know, and I was probably six years old. You know, I mean, the, the whole thing with the ocean and, and it's being... Um, um, really abused. Um, it's been happening my whole life, and I'm 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 almost 61. So uh, so I think that that's kind of just like a that just seems like this current issue that kind of really hasn't gone away. It's only gotten worse. And um, so although I normally agree with you, I I think that when when it comes to this particular subject that he's picked about the ocean and praising the ocean and the importance of it, then in a way I feel like there's maybe almost a sort of a timelessness about it. Well, he has written some, some very angry uh, poems. Uh, Jason uh, D., uh, thank you for that uh, link to that Smithsonian uh, talk. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, where he actually uh, puts in his uh, his young daughter in the poem, you know, uh, interspersed with these horrible things, and then, you know, men mention of his daughter, and then some more atrocities and terrible things uh, going on. Um, it and he's kind of billed as a political activist, as well as a poet and a scholar and all those other things. So yes, more so than, uh, than most, but he and a, a lot of these poets that, that we've been reading in this, uh, you know, Rothenberg uh, umbrella kind of a, a course have, have been very angry and very active and very vocal. Uh, and I don't know, I, I have mixed feelings about it uh, in, in the sense that there's some justification and in the sense that some people uh, can do it well, like uh, that uh, Leslie Marmon Silco, the example I gave before, where she's not blaming people, she's uh, putting herself in that situation and uh, sort, of, sort of just laying, laying it out for us to see. So we can make our own judgments about what's going on, who's to blame. Uh, even uh, here where he's saying our pollution of the oceans, he's, he's again not pointing blame, which, which makes that political uh, poetry very hard to take. Uh, there, there's kind of a way of walking a line through it that, that makes us listen in an objective way rather than being defensive or being uh, gung-ho, yeah, I, I believe what he's saying. We, we can listen and make up our own minds. And that to me is what makes a good political poem as opposed to uh, a bad one. Um, Craig, I just downloaded a sound boosting app, but it only works with music. So you're just gonna, <laughs> have, to, you're just gonna have to shout a little bit. Or sing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think you have to even go like, uh, like imagine that you're on the other side of a football field. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasant uh, chat we'll have. Thank <laughs> uh, for reading my poetry and, and for having me in your class today. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to run to, you know, my daughter is, is waking up right now. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I just want to wish you all uh, you know, and, and good health in the days ahead. And, you know, I, I just think it's amazing that all of you are XR from all around the world and, and are studying, um, you know, Pacific poetry. It's been exciting. <laughs> 
you know, I just want to say thank you, Jason, as well. You're welcome. And I'm sorry, I got, I got cut out for, for some of the conversation, but um, I'm just really happy folks are, are engaging with these questions of, of culture and language, politics and ecology uh, within poetry, and thinking about how we can uh, you know, talk about these, these ideas and, and human experiences through to our writing and, and, and narratives. <laughs> I'm on, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. And engage some more. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, stay safe and, and you know, I hope hope you have a great journey as you continue to read poetry for, for this course. Okay, thank you so much. All right, all right, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Aloha. Can you Thanks hear for me? arranging that, Jason? Oh, you're, you're welcome. You know what? What happened is this came together so quickly because um, he saw a post I had put on Twitter about he friended me on Twitter, mm. and so I immediately wrote back to him and said, "Are you available on Sunday night?" <laughs> <laughs> cool. So it was a kind of total coincidence. Um, but I, I think uh, since, since he's going to go um, take care of his daughter, I wonder if we, we might just read his poem about his daughter, talk about that a little, and then, and then we can finish up. But I'm happy, I, I mean, uh, on Thursday night, I was on the phone and I mean, I was in the forum here until three in the morning. So <laughs> I'm, I can talk forever. Um, but, but what, you know, it's, uh, one thing that I, that <clears throat> I really struck me as I was putting this little photo sequence together is how, like when if we look at, um, let's see if I can show that. Hold on one sec. I'm trying to uh, share my Buttons are very really stubborn. Um, I'm going to go back to my, um, but but what what's so striking is um, like right now I'm looking at a, on my screen an image of a map of the Ring of Fire. And above it, uh, U.S. soldiers patrolling. And he, Craig did mention at one point a, a tsunami wave. And um, I looked up, you know, the number of earthquakes off the coast of Guam. It, you know, there's the earthquake of 1987, 1992, 1997, 2003. There are these, um, and these are, you know, all volcanic, volcanic islands. And uh, uh, Dan Talalupapa uh, McMullen, who lives on American Samoa, um, just a few years ago, there was a massive tsunami that uh, killed a huge number of people. Um, so the ocean is both uh, like na nature in this region is both a um, source of sustenance and identity, 
but it is also a source of, I mean, it, we can compare the explosion of Krakatoa to the nuclear bomb tests. You know, the Pacific is, a, is also a place of tsunamis and volcano, volcanoes and, and earthquakes and massive typhoons. So it is not always Pacific. It is not necessarily a, a peaceful place. Um, I have to tell you, you put up that map of the nuclear testing. And for some reason in my mind, I did not have it being so widespread. I imagine it being on like one or two islands and they just kept dropping bombs on those one or two islands, but it seemed like it was all over the Pacific. Yeah, you could only do it once per island. You couldn't do it once, once you did it on one island, you had to find a new, a new one to do it again. Um, but, uh, yeah, this, so, but this, this website that I, I made, I mean, what I'm planning on doing is, um, as the course continues, you know, over the next few days, I'm going to continue to do this, but, um, I want to build uh, a big resource for, um, so that there will be um, a website for each kind of uh, geogra geographical language group. Um, and that website will be very dense with lots of information and is a resource that you can keep coming back to for as long as you want. And, and I think I, um, I figured out how to add a forum function to my website. So, I mean, some of, you know, you could be thinking about this, you know, in a year and a half and uh, the, this website is, is going to just kind of keep growing in, in, with different pages. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's my, my personal mission project. I think that's so cool. Um, it's just chock full of resources now. And I, I really think, if, especially if you take this uh, and have this another session in next year's slow pro. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, let's, let's um, uh, read um, just because um, it's 20 hours. I'm sorry that I have this voice, but I have no t consciousness of time, so I have to be reminded of what time it is every 15 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm serious. It's, it's, it's an actual diagnosis. Um, but uh, the so this poem, Understory, do, can people access it? on their website or uh, on their PDF. It's, um, it's page, yeah. page 11, if you scroll down. What's the, what's the poem it's we want to do? It's called Understory. Yeah, I have it right here. You got it? Do you want to uh, read it for us? Uh, sure. Great. Nalani, 
and I walk to our small community, garden plot and manoa. The seed packets in my pocket sound like a baby's toy rattle. When do they spray with faucet? I guess that's, I'm not sure how that word is spelled, along the sidewalks. From Cunha and Wamia, 50,000 acres of GMO fields. How will open air pesticides drift affect our unborn daughter, whose nerve endings are just beginning to root? We plant seeds in rows, soil gathers under our fingernails. Syngenta, DuPont, Dow, Pioneer, BASF, Monsanto, 240 million seed sector, corn for cattle feed, and syrup runoff turns our streams red, poisoned. Loey, 50,000 heart sea urchins die off. What will our daughter be able to plant in this paradise of fugitive dust? Some somebody else want to read it, or should I read it again? Or um, yeah, why doesn't somebody else? Why doesn't somebody else read it? Because it's pretty depressing. That's why. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty Very sad. <laughs> well, the one the one point I did want to make is that the. I think I think the the native words the, the pigeon and whatnot. I I'm really a, a really very much impressed how there's it puts a, a like almost a swaying rhythm that seems to reflect the the motion of the ocean. And and it's a I really enjoy it. I I know, I know you said that some people seem uh, put away from it, but I think it it does. One thing it does is it, it adds to the timelessness of the poem. Right. And the, and the timelessness of the poem. Right. The, well, what's interesting about this poem is the inclusion of biochemical, like biotech words, like that sequence of, of names of companies is like the inverse of the sequence of the the names of the ocean what different people call the ocean i mean it functions yeah. in the same kind of chant kind of way um but but you know what might be interesting is on the next page um this is so we've heard words in Hawaiian, but the next poem um, on the next page is one Craig suggested to me that is written in Hawaiian pidgin. So it's not written in the Hawaiian indigenous language. It's written in the, in the pidgin that formed um among all the workers on the, who came to the fields to work who communicated on, on the fields amongst themselves and also had to be you know understand the master's commands in english so um so this is Hawaii's third language, pidgin, which um, we're going to make a, a, a global leap in the next, you know, 24 hours to the Caribbean, another seabound place. And um, we're going to be thinking not about uh, like the the situation in the Caribbean is that the indigenous speakers were all killed off almost immediately by disease and deliberately by the Spaniards. Yeah, that's true. So they went extinct and their language went extinct. 
So it's a very different situation than that, which is on Hawaii, where the indigenous speakers continued to live after their contact with the American Europeans. Um, so I think as a transition of, in terms of thinking about um, the imperatives of especially Jamaican poetry and Trinidadian poetry is uh, just to take a look at this poem and see how it, how it sounds to us. The other thing I wanted to say, Dave, specifically about the Hawaiian language is that there are no, um, there, I think the, it, it has very few consonants in it and almost the, the only consonants that are used are liquid consonants like M, N, L. Um, there aren't any like sharp, like, I mean, there might be a kakua, kakua ma, mauna kia. So there are some uh, like sharp sounds, but predominantly if you listen to someone speaking continuously in Hawaiian, it's like floating on waves in the ocean just because the language is so liquid in its, its rhythm without any um, like sharp breaks. So, so let's go um, to the next poem called The Mainland to Me. And again, like I, I said, um, like I said in, in the email I sent today, the concept of a Creole language, which is what this is, and what uh, the Jamaican um, language is, a Creole is a very specific linguistic phenomenon that occurs when a lot of different people who speak different languages are, are kind of forced and put together um, under some other power. Um, and her book, I, like I said, is to understand the sentiment behind the language that we're going to encounter in the Jamaican and Trinidadian poets, you really need to read the Lisa uh, Lynn Kinney book, which is a very clear explanation of how a language like this uh, forms and functions in the society. Um, okay, so who, Dave, why don't you read uh, this poem? The, the Mainland to Me? Yeah. Let me see if I can get it big enough so I can read it. Okay, here we go. Hey, how's it, brah? I hear you going mainland, eh? No, I going to the continent. What? I thought you was going to San Jose to <laughs> San Jose po, po a visit to your brother. That's right. Then you're going mainland, brah. No, I'm going to the continent. What you mean continent, brah? The mainland is the mainland. That's what you're going, eh? Hey, like I told you, that's the continent. Hawaii is the mainland to me. <laughs> I hope I didn't overdo that. <laughs> no, I don't think you did overdo it at all. Uh, that was perfect. I, I, I really liked that. I, I really thought that was cool. Yeah. If they ever do a books on tape for uh, this poem, you should read it. <laughs> I really think. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, how, um, so what, 
this kind of so this this is a like I've read much like poems in in pigeon that are are much more difficult to understand because they blend in a lot of other words from other languages. Um, but what is the, uh, I don't know, like what is the, the texture, the feel that you get from this poem? Who, who, who me or any? Anybody. Dave, what, what, what about you? Oh, I, I, I just feel there's a, there's a certain amount of warts, especially with the, you know, the brada, that's right. Then you go into the main man, bra, you know, it's, it's like, there's, it's a very informal, almost, uh, you know, you can almost feel their arms around each other. Right. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the texture I'm feeling. I don't know. Right. Well, that's what, what's important. What's, what's crucial um, in response to that is bra isn't a term of affection. It is a vocabulary word in this language. Well, I think there's a, a stronger warmth in the in the language, just inherently in the language. Wouldn't, yeah, am I reading too much into that? No, no, I, I don't. I don't think uh, that you are. Um, it's it, but but what do we? Um, I I guess. What happened in, in Hawaii um, is that there are, Hawaii is linguistically segregated, sharp, strictly. Um, there are enclaves of native Hawaiian speakers. There are very poor popula populations of pigeon speakers um, and I would say that there is some uh, parallel between like and, and the, the, the wealthy people from the continent who live in uh, Hawaii all send their children to private formal English schools because they don't want their children's English to get messed up by this in this uh, messy pigeon language. Um, and it's uh, it's identical to the situation where in I don't know what was it about 20 years ago where there were they were going to teach ebonics in San Francisco um and that was considered a scandal that you would teach it's 2015 that you would teach uh, like that ebonics is not real english and isn't a language and um doesn't, you know, doesn't have any place in the school. But I would say that if you look at this poem closely, it follows a, its own internal grammar and vocabulary and obeys the rules of any, any fully formed comp complex language. Well, this may also not be primarily a written language. It's, it's not. And it was never allowed to be written. Um, because the, it, it, again, like I said, once you, um, 
like if I was your real professor, I would give an exam on the Linda, uh, the, 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 uh, what is it called? Sista tongue. I would give uh, an exam on Sista tongue and weight it as 70% of the final grade. It's it's that important. Like you you have to read it, and it will open up so much of what we've looked at and are going to look at um, in such a clear way. And and it's really I think uh, you really need to give it no more than um, maximum twenty minutes to read the whole thing. Probably you can read it in 15 minutes. Hmm. Well, if you don't uh, think too much while you're reading, you know, to, yes, to to just get through it because it's the, the short little paragraphs or sentences uh, so you can get through it very quickly. But it, like many poems, you just want to keep going back and uh, studying those little clips and right. there are so many different kinds, right? There's exactly. there's the actual speaking, uh, but then there's there's all uh, every every different uh, I don't know field thrown in there, medical terms and historical terms and uh, right. literary. It it just it, it's pretty amazing piece of work, and, and it's like you know the replacement for that would, would be one of these, uh, what do you call those, uh, not an anthology, but you know, when there's a, a topic uh, that they, they produce a book, you know, with a scientific papers or, right, or just right. different things in it, there's a name for it, but it- uh, A monograph or something? Yes, yeah, something like that. Um, it, just well, so full of information. Right, well, what what's, this is the, the astonishing, like mind-blowing point that I have about sister tongue is that exactly what you described, that kind of snippets from all different kinds of fields and forms of language and disciplines is exactly the, is exactly models the formation of a creole. Yeah, it does so, reflect that, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah it's formally um, a brilliant, it's brilliant in the way that it does that. It It is really, it's like it, it's, you, you experience a, um, you experience this kind of cacophony of different voices in little bits and, and have to kind of put them all together. Well, I, th I think the formatting is such a big help with that. Yeah. The formatting is just brilliant, it's hard. Yeah. I, the way it hit me, it's almost like it takes a, it's like if you take a melody that you wrote on the piano and all of a sudden orchestrate it, it just becomes so, colorful and you know you, you just all of a sudden start seeing the, the right. depths of yeah and it's i think it's a real it's a real uh poetic deci decision on her part to have like the photocopy the yeah. photocopy material and the kind of scrap pieces of language um that is that is integral to the 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 formal poetic mechanics of the piece. Yeah, I see this as like a play or a movie where you know I think we've seen this with whether for voiceovers or or different characters. You know, you you could see the protagonist or the person. You could see the little brother. You see the sister herself talking, 
and then you'd see a guy in a in a white medical lab coat or something talking, mm -hmm. and then a historian, you know, professor like uh, saying his little piece, and just you know jumping back and forth and actually performing that that play and all those different voices. Right. Yeah. yeah. I I was really blown away by the the the, the typewritten, you know, the typewritten. Uh, documents and communiques that were, were entered into it and right. the, that, the way that contrasted with the the large lettered words right the, the little you know fragments of sentences that were enlarged it just was uh, i just thought it was absolutely brilliant i really enjoyed it yeah it phenomenal yeah i i i really want to um spread the word about it yeah it's 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 amazing i it's uh, just so I, I was just blown away by it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, seventy percent on our test, so we better uh, we better know it pretty well. <laughs> exactly. Well, and it's I mean, and I mean, and what is so, you know, it, I mean, by coincidence, she developed this one-on-one -on -one language with her brother, who happened to have yeah. So it's like at the core of the book is this language between just two people that no one else can understand. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, there is, I remember Al talking about how he and his mother had this little communique. It was like a little thing. She would leave things in his lunchbox that only he would understand and stuff like right, that. Right. There's a, like, that does happen between people who are, you know, you, you know, married people and people who spend a lot of time together and they do develop there's certain things that have certain meaning just to them. But her, her brother, like, literally uh, had, uh, like, has uh, not a, a, a very divert, anatomically divergent physical tongue. Mm-hmm. So he actually c couldn't even speak the pigeon. Yeah. So well, to, to the whole, yeah, the, all the imaging of the tongue and the, even the picture of the tongue and you know, right. the drawings and the descriptions and everything. It's just, a, it's just real. I just thought the whole thing was amazing. It was just, Great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that. But, but I, I also think this last one that we just wrote, this uh, the mainland to me, is you know is also extremely powerful in that same vein. You know, it's a there's I it's a I don't know that there's certain things that go on with the where the question marks with the exclamation point after it and then the the yeah. comma a question mark exclamation point and it's almost like you can hear it you know because with the it's right. a, it's as it as Michael pointed out that it is a spoken language. It's not a, they're right. trying to transcribe a spoken language onto the paper. Right. Yeah, it, and it is, and it's um. And uh, I mean these pigeons or creoles emerged out of. I mean. They, they were, I mean, it's, it's astonishing that, that there were, that there are so many Creoles, like variations on this uh, around the world, wherever there was a colonial power that brought together people from, of different languages under one roof to like work in the fields. So, so I would say that um, something that is on the, that, that we d just didn't have time to get into in, in the course is the, the way that say an uh, African American moves between like a crisp, formal 
public language and like a, la a language that's spoken in the neighborhood and with family that has its own entire grammar and vocabulary. I saw something similar to that or experienced it um, visiting Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, they would have, they would talk to me with a very more proper uh, language and then they would turn and talk to them each other and it was, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was wild. Yeah. So um, it, there's, there's definitely uh, these, uh, like, these language, I'm sure that's, these are not the only ex parts, of, uh, examples around the world. No, but we need to think about specifically the, the situation of slavery and the indiscriminate, like, taking of, uh, like, putting together of people from Africa, none of whom spoke the same language. So think of working in the cotton fields all day with, you know, 30 other people, none of whom speak your language. Yeah. I, I found it interesting that they, throughout a lot of this, they don't refer to the, they refer to them as the, they, the workers they brought in. They refer to them as workers <laughs> rather than yes. slaves. Right. And, yeah. and they were, um, I mean, this, th that is what, I mean, they weren't bought and sold. I mean, it was more like uh, indentured servitude, like where you would go like work on a, a pineapple plantation and get like- Please charge me. You get paid in pennies that would all go to purchasing food and you get tied into essentially, a de you, you would never get paid enough to change your situation. I owe my soul to the company store. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's everywhere. Yeah, and, and some of that that you were describing before, and, and Craig was talking about that too, of, you know, the language uh, spoken at home, and then again, uh, among uh, his, his relatives, and e even in the marriage, you know, two, two different uh, uh, native languages, uh, right. his parents. And I, I think uh, possibly uh, for the African-American experience, uh, the same thing. The Please kids, charge me. Kids going to uh, to school and learning so-called proper English and then speaking uh, whatever uh, whatever they did at at home, the street or neighborhood. Battery uh, charging. Right, and and them being judged as less intelligent. Yeah. As a result of that. Um, which is a link, like, uh, you know. A, a, it's 2030. It's a linguistic catastrophe. And basically what happened in Jamaica is after they got the, after the British left, um, the, it would be basically like, we're going to see that the Jamaican people basically claim their Creole as an official um, high language. So there's, uh, so, so that that place, which is also comprised of the descendants of slaves, you know, thousands, probably literally thousands of different African languages. Um, the, the British 
enforced the teaching of formal British English only in the schools. And so the move, kind of the first move when the British left, when the British flag came down, everybody finally started speaking in their own language. In, in their own Creole. And to kind of go through a period of getting over a kind of internalized shame about not being proper English speakers and to kind of claim their own language as nothing to be ashamed of. And that's, that's pretty much the story of the next few days. One at a time, please, Jason. <laughs> no, I, I asked if I could extend the course, but Al said no. So I've got to, uh, I'm cutting out a lot and uh, keeping it, I'm going to keep it as simple as possible and, and really um, keep, having since we're all shut-ins just uh you know every two or three days or or more frequently offer these video chats um because every day we'll have something new to talk about yeah. well there are other uh, courses coming so to be fair to them yeah absolutely i i i um my i i basically tried to to teach a class that that really needed a year, yeah, to be taught properly in, yeah. in eight weeks. Dave, um, what was that? Oh, it's my cigar. It's not a joint. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was a joint. <laughs> I can't afford that I'm, stuff. <laughs> talking about Jamaica, I was just wondering. <laughs> Actually, I think this is Jamaican. No, it's not Jamaican. No, it's a. I think it's Nicaragua. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> In, enjoy, and I, I just loved your note about the uh, the scotch and the cigars. I, I thought you were kidding, but now I see. Oh, no, I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we all have to get on the ball then for next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You got to stock up in this stuff. They're, go they're closing the stores down. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's true. Home delivery. What what country were they delivering uh, marijuana? I don't remember. Uh, California. Was it California? Oh, that country. <laughs> that country. <laughs> um, oh, really? They they are. Um, yeah, yeah. They're all, they 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 made a special waiver on it because so people don't come to the stores. Right. Wow. Well, well medic for medical uses only. Of course. Not for recreational uses. Right. Well, yeah, I guess the way it works is you smoke enough, you don't care if you get ill. Well, part of our, <laughs> part of our, uh, our, uh, our ideological uh, disease is thinking that those two things have to be separate. Yeah, yeah, part of it. Yeah. Uh, I've got to go. This, uh, I, yeah. I hate to yeah. leave these uh, events, yeah. Jason. All right. Well, I, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm exhausted. I yeah. uh, was yeah. up all night getting ready for this. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate your, all your work here, Jason. I'm really I'm really enjoying yeah. it. Well, so where where does Craig hang out? Is it on on Twitter or? Uh, yeah, he's on. We look Twitter. for him. He's on Twitter and Facebook, and he invited everyone to friend him on Twitter and Facebook. Okay. Uh, so I would, I would feel free to do that. Okay, thank you. Yes, you will. Thank you, Jason. This was, uh, yeah. as usual, a great, uh, great session. Appreciate yeah. it. If yeah, I, absolutely. If you guys, if any of you guys could um, write a note to, if you, have, if you have a minute to write a note to Al, to just, you know, let him know. Yeah, he put that. We saw that note in uh, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. people. 
I just want to, I mean, because to me, the, the, the course is an ethical imperative because we don't, th these aren't, because Mod Poe is designed to follow a different trajectory in po poetics history. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me to incorporate these other voices is my, my own politics. Yeah, this, this could be its, a, its own, mod, or not Mod Poe, but a ethno -po. Coursera course. This could be its own course. It's, it's ethno -po. I I want to I mean no. I I want to say that it's American English poetry. <laughs> I I would I would agree with it. Technically, it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why why, you know, it, it's American poetry. Why, you know, and it's, and it's most of it's modern. Yeah, right. And and yeah. I don't think I don't think that the poetry that we're reading would be possible without uh, the experiments of the modernists. Yeah, they, I, yeah, they talk about that. I mean... Like, I, to me, this is um, that, that like, when modernism kind of breaks down in the 60s, there are two trajectories there is a kind of experimental poetics trajectory, and then there is this kind of not ethno poetics, but more um, kind of identity poetics, or that uh, deals with um, the po like queer feminist. Um, Asian American poetic are all, you know, communities of poetry that are as kind of cohesive into the, unto themselves as say like the language poets. Well, but sure. even uh, in the, well, I don't know if the group the language poets, but you know, the Black Mountain School and the New York School. It's all white men. <sighs> Yeah, but but actually, I mean, I mean, <laughs> we were, I mean, Amiri Baraka, enough. Amiri Baraka took off. Yeah, who wrote that? Uh, what was it? The assassination. Yeah. Of uh, Leroy Jones. Right. Jones. Right. Where he assassinated himself. Exactly. <laughs> His old self. Yeah. So I mean, he didn't he eventually so there's that kind of path that he takes and then this other path um again but, so much to to think about jason but uh, but, uh time to go to bed yes yeah, time to go. <laughs> okay <laughs> take yeah, care everybody being so clumsy with the technology here but i think i have it down now okay We're <laughs> all, we all have a learning curve so yeah, yeah. all of us Take care, folks. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Good to talk thank to you, everybody. Jason. All right. Take care. Bye bye. All right, bye, guys. Trying to figure out how to turn this off now. <laughs> Lower right hand corner, leave meeting. Okay. Um.